Welcome to the podcast. This show is about the Real Estate Network Training Society community, also known as Rents. We're a diverse group of investors and our members range from beginners to seasoned pros. Rents is the only charity real estate education company in Canada and we're here to help you on your journey to financial freedom using real estate. My name is Sam Perrin. I'm the president of Rents and I'll be your host today. I'm a full-time real estate investor who's retired as a police officer at the age of 30 to spend more time with my family. Now I help people create passive income through real estate. As you'll see from the many stories shared on this show, there's lots of roads that will take you to your goals. When you hear the diverse experiences of our guests, I bet that you'll find a path that mirrors your own and this will inspire you to take the actions needed to build your wealth too. When you become financially free, you're better positioned to make the world a better place. And that's what we're all about. You can send any questions or suggestions for the show to info at rents.website. That's info at R-E-N-T-S dot website. Enjoy the show. All right, uh, Pierre Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really nice to have you, and it's going to be great to uh, to reconnect uh, uh, next next week at the uh, uh, monthly uh uh, rents meeting. We're we're fortunate that your uh, your son is uh, taking university in our particular uh, city, uh, so we get to see you more often than I think we would otherwise. So uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I think I'm pretty happy about that too. So. No. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, uh, you know, many many of our listeners will be f- familiar with you, but we do have uh, some people that are brand new to you know real yeah. estate, uh, brand new real estate education, so they won't won't have watched uh, um, you over the last uh, um, you know I, I don't know how long you've been doing this publicly five years longer maybe well, ten years ten uh, years. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, across Canada, by the way, too, eh? Across Canada. Oh yeah, yeah. You spoke it in front of thousands and thousands, and yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, and my and actually my business partner Rod uh, took uh, uh, one of your courses. Um, yeah. Or, or, or maybe maybe more than that. And now you know, uh, you you've uh, you've been the catalyst for a lot of multifamily real estate investors. So it's a real pl- pr- I pr- privilege. I hope to talk. so. It's not easy, right? It's not easy, but it's uh, it's well worth it. Yeah. For- so uh, it was it was great uh, chatting a little bit ahead of uh, the program here. What I wanted to uh, uh, talk about more, uh, we're going to get lots of uh, your expertise at the rents event. But uh, you know, I wanted to give her. There's never enough time for networking, and. Uh, yeah. And so the, the point, whole point of this uh, podcast is so we can get uh, the rents members and, and everyone else can get a, um, get to know you a little bit more personally, um, and uh, you know the man behind behind the. Uh, um, Behind the legend, I guess you yeah. could say, right? So, um, can you can you start off just by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So, how I got into real estate investing? Well, first of all, my wife started the traditional way, which is to invest uh, in small rental properties. Yeah. So, once we got married, I was the guy doing the maintenance, <laughs> doing the painting, the the units, uh, fixing the roof, uh, all sort of stuff. So, with smaller single homes that my wife and uh, our brother-in-law had together. So that's my first, well, actually, I should backtrack. As a student, university student, I was the on-site manager in the building where I lived. I no this is in Ottawa. Uh, so uh, renting out, uh, doing evictions, all of that. And I was a law student at the time. So that's my first uh, experience with <laughs> landlording, if you will. No kidding. Uh, and then, like I said, met my wife. She had a few houses. And so, you know, became familiar with that side of things. And over time, I ended up working with uh, CMHC. So at some point, I said, well, I need to learn the, the core business of CMHC. Uh, so I ended up uh, transferring from Ottawa to Calgary in the underwriting department uh, at CMHC Calgary's regional office. And I was first job, I was a single home underwriter. When you buy a home, your per, per, per principal residence... Right. Uh, there's an underwriting process, right? Yeah. And uh, underwriting by that, I wanted to find those terms. Sometimes it's not clear to everybody. At well, least it wasn't me. Yeah, and that you know, Pierre Paul, that's most people's experience with CMHC is when they buy the first home. Exactly. They're putting they're putting in five or ten percent, exactly. and and that's where they hear about CMHC. Oh, these are the guys taking extra money and putting it on my. Pre- the pre- go. premium goes on the mortgage. <laughs> okay, whatever. Exactly. In my house. Exactly. Exactly true. It's very true what you're saying. So the, the process of underwriting, which is the core of my expertise, why I ended up doing what I'm doing now, is the, the underwriting process is the process of assessing 
and mitigating the risk pertaining to that you know purchase of a principal residence or apartment building so all that to say that I moved to the Calgary office and I pretty much went all around I did single underwriting so underwriting homes not very long after that they shifted me because the idea there was a it was an internship for a couple of years to learn the core business of CMHC then they sent me to the default management and real estate department DMRE and it's got two components one is uh, real estate, which is when borrowers, again, of principal residences or small rental properties, one to four units, default on their mortgage payments. The banks try to, uh, you know, correct the situation, catch up uh, late payments and all of that. If the borrowers are un unable to do that, then uh, the banks will start the s sale process of selling the property, right? Because people are defaulting on their mortgages. Yeah. And after a certain time of exposure on the market, if that doesn't work, then those properties would be transferred back to CMHC because CMHC insured, you know, the lenders against claims. So my job was to manage that department and, you know, lower the price a little bit and put these properties back on the market to sell them so that we can pay the lenders' claims and all of that. So that's one side of the, that's the real estate side. The other side of the default management in real estate is the default management. I was in charge of managing defaults of apartment buildings. So it's a key. When I teach this stuff, I always remind people I teach it from the offensive as well as the defensive perspective. I know what a bad deal looks like. Yeah, uh, That could be a whole different conversation that perhaps that the, your, your folks can ask me questions in that regard. But oh, we'll it's important. It. And, and here's the good news, uh, Sam. I was bored out of my mind in the default management department. There were no defaults, hardly. And to this day, I can tell you, I was just mentioning to you, in Alberta, the economy, at least the rental market, overall, the economy is improving now since the great, well, since the recession we've had in the last few years. But uh, from a real estate point of view, it still is a tough market in Alberta. Despite that, uh, my, my lenders confirmed they hardly have any defaults. Okay, so it's very telling in terms of asset class. It is a low risk asset, right? And so, but so then they moved me. I was bored out of my mind in default management because I had no defaults to no apartment building defaults to manage. Then I switched over to multifamily underwriting, and then I had a big ha ha moment where I I saw how much money people were making. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess during the <laughs> right. Hi. Hey, I I could do this too, right? <laughs> Exactly. I said, I want to join the parade. I mean, I just don't want to be in other people's loans because I could see people uh, creating huge amounts of wealth. And I said, you know, and I, I didn't like it. This is my coming out as an entrepreneur. I didn't like to be in a cubicle. Uh, you know, Sam is a great employer, was a fantastic employer, but it is at the end of the day, a government bureaucratic entity. And that, that's just, I said, that's it. Wanted to be the master of my fate, the captain of my soul, yeah. uh, to quote the poem by uh, William Ernest Henley, but uh, Invictus. So anyways, that's my story. And that's been my experience since then. I, uh, I teach, I, I've been speaking uh, at various, you know, real estate associations for the last 10 years. Rain was one of them, the Investor Forum. I won pretty much every award you can think of, whether it's from crew uh, as a service provider with the live events, uh, training live events that I do on investing in apartment buildings, uh, and all sort of awards. Uh, I have a live experiential event that I've been doing for the last, uh, since 2011, so uh, seven years or so. Uh, and now I have an online product, but that's pretty much what I do. I own 160 doors, portfolio worth uh, 22, 23 million dollars, yeah. and that's all I do. So that's sort of my story in a nutshell. Yeah, that's not a boring path. <laughs> so you, you know what you touched you touched a, a little bit on uh, you know your your university life uh, when you were the manager yeah. of an onsite. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, growing up? Uh, uh, where, where, where did you grow up? And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's hear a bit about that. Yeah, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Uh, I appreciate the question. I come from a long way. Um, no doubt. <laughs> emotionally, and so I'm number nine of a family of 12. Yeah. Uh, we have, I have uh, five brothers and six sisters, believe it or not. My poor mo mother, she's, she's, she's passed away because that heart of hers made so many revolutions that at 59 it just poo and blew up. <laughs> But, uh, and, and so I, I grew up in the small town on the border from Montreal is seven hours northwest on the border with Ontario, okay. mining town. Um, you know, great family environment. Uh, if you love the outdoors, which I still do, I'm a backcountry hiker, you know, and even I've hiked all over the world as well. Uh, but um, it was an environment with limiting beliefs, right? Uh, we were not rich. We were actually poor, not terribly poor, but I, can I couldn't play hockey. 
because yeah. my parents couldn't afford to buy me skates. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, I appreciate the question because, you know, at the end of the day, to do what you're doing, we face a lot of limiting beliefs, right? And our job is to, you know, go inside and, and identify these and, you know, bust them, right? right? And so I certainly grew up with a lot of limiting beliefs towards wealth, right? Oh, wealthy people are bad people and this and that. Definitely, I grew up in that environment. And, and of course, the moment I decided that uh, that wasn't for me, those are not my own personal beliefs. And I wanted to buy multi-million dollar buildings. You got to shift your mindset in a significant way. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's, but it was a great environment to grow up in. And went on to, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a world traveler. I love traveling to this day. My kids are the same now. My daughter just came back from a six month trip to She's 18 in South America where she studied Spanish and did some volunteer work. My wife joined her. They will travel to Patagonia. That's my family. I've been like that. I've always wanted to travel. So once I got out of uh, high school, went to Brazil for a year with the Rotary Club, learned uh, Portuguese, came back, went to CJEP, which is college in Quebec for a couple of years. Then I wanted to go to Europe and I learned Italian, uh, then completed my diploma and then went... Uh, where did I go after that? I went uh, to Italy, so I learned Italian. <laughs> then came back, went to U of T, uh, did a degree in political science and uh, a concentration in international relations, then went on a big trip around the world. Uh, and then I got a law degree from Ottawa U. So that's sort of my, my story from a school point of view. Yeah. So I got a law degree and uh, even a teacher's degree, I uh, hate to say, but uh, oh, it was well, an easy good. one to get. So, yeah. Hey, uh, so, so that's from a school point of view, yeah. Where, 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 did you, where did you meet your wife along the way? So I met my wife in Ottawa, where I spent a lot of time, like I said, working with CMHC. And yeah. uh, that's, uh, yeah, she, uh, she, uh, she's a nurse and she's always wanted to travel. Hadn't traveled much at that point. Uh, and got a job in Switzerland for a year, so she took a leave of absence from her job in the hospital in Gatineau, uh, just across from Ottawa. Yeah. And uh, we fell in love, and uh, I traveled to Europe a lot that year, and then now, you know, it's 21 years later, three kids and a bunch of buildings. And, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's the story. It's been, uh, it's been a fun path. So you, but, uh, and you have two, two children in university? Three, three kids. Three. So two, two my own. Yeah. yeah. One that's his, at, who, who is at TRU, he's 20, yeah. uh, second year in sciences. And then my daughter, 18, she's going to U of A in Edmonton starting in September. And then I have a 13-year-old son. So, uh, yeah. So they grow fast, Sam. Enjoy your time with your little ones because it uh, doesn't take long for them to grow uh you know, but uh, we yeah. have a lot of fun. We do. Uh, we're a very close knit family. Uh, we travel. My son, uh, two years ago, did something similar to my daughter. He went to South America to Peru to learn Spanish and also do some volunteer work. And I joined up with him. We trekked uh, five days to Machu Picchu and uh, went mountain biking in Bolivia. You know, we're adventurous people. You know, yeah, and, uh, it's, cool. it's cool. Yeah, well, I do. I do love your photos uh, <laughs> that you show in your presentations of uh, everywhere you go. Yeah, and, well, uh, it's, it's and it's the motivation, right, Sam? What yeah. we do is not necessarily easy. Uh, being real estate investors, and and uh, it's true. You know, it's uh, but but you get benefits, right? You're the master of your own fate and yeah. captain of your soul. So you know there are some benefits. But yeah, it's been a. I'm never bored. <laughs> no, no, I've no, never no. been. I've never had a boring life, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's an exciting life for sure, a passionate yeah. life. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, um, family being so important to, to both of us. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, we we were scheduled to do this last night, and then of course, uh, you know, <laughs> my kids and my wife. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was problems with bedtime, and uh, and uh, anyway, you were very accommodating, so I appreciate that. But it's nice that you kind of understand You're welcome. <laughs> how how that goes. So it was past my bedtime, anyways, too. Okay, by the way, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. people should know that it's what what time is it? Uh, you and I have been uh, it's six o'clock a.m. here, so <laughs> it's early. Yeah, so, well, it, well, yeah. Now it's ten to six. We've been talking for a while. <laughs> ten to six. Uh, we each have a coffee, so British we're good. Columbia. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I'll have you know, by the way, if you have folks uh, from your 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 group, uh, remember, I still have my. Uh, my uh, gratitude rock still you know, sitting here from that I picked up from the shores of Lake Titicaca. This is this is very real. I have this on me. First thing I make sure when I get up and get dressed that I have my my gratitude rock. It's it's been a fun life. It is a fun life. Challenging at times, but you know yeah. we're we're blessed. I feel blessed for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah we're 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 blessed. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. And you know what? I love the name of your company, uh, Matterhorn. Um, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's fabulous. Uh, 
So, obviously, you see the connection there, right? Switzerland. Sam, Switzerland. The connect- yeah. So this is where my wife, when I met her, she took off for Switzerland, mm-hmm. and I traveled to Switzerland a lot. Uh, so there's a connection with Matterhorn. Her and I, before we married, we hiked up to Zermatt and uh, you know stayed at a refuge and across from the Matterhorn. Uh, it's also a metaphor for life. I think life is a, is a mountain. If you're not climbing, in my opinion, or evolving, you're you're dying. That's my philosophy, and I I believe that to be the truth. Yeah. Uh, but also, we still continue to have a connection with Switzerland. Uh, one of my best buddies from UFT moved to Switzerland. Okay. I have neighbors here. I live in Cochrane, just outside Calgary. Uh, they they're business owners. They also moved to Switzerland. So it's a country we end up a lot. It's kind of central. When we go to Europe, we land in you know Geneva and visit our friends. So um, it's a beautiful, amazing country. Very expensive, but yeah, there's a lot of connection, and it is important. I appreciate you pick up on good things. You're a good man. I know that um, <laughs> on these little things. But you know, you find meaning in everything you want. Like you know, whether it's the gratitude rock. Or Matterhorn, it's it's a company. It's it's my it, it tells me it reminds me of uh, my love story with my wife that's ongoing. Twenty one years later, it reminds me of some of my best friends that still live in Switzerland. Um, you know, and uh, and it's a company that I create. As you know, we we contribute to charity. We sponsor children yeah. in Africa and uh, in South America, and Brazil, as a matter of fact. So you know, and trying to find meaning in everything that you do in every day, and that's how you motivate yourself to get through the challenges. But yeah, it's everything is intentional as much as possible right sometimes you deviate but overall you know you keep focus on what drives you what motivates you you know especially in hard times uh when the the real estate portfolio is not doing as great you know uh it it supports you and keeps you going in those tough times so can you walk us through uh your journey going from uh you know employee to uh uh, to, yeah. to entrepreneur, can you uh, just walk us through that a little bit? A- absolutely, yeah. No, absolutely, Sam. That's um, so. I, you know, working for a crown corporation such as CMAC is very confining. Yeah. Uh, you got a, a song sheet that you sing from, and you cannot deviate. You know, during 2009, when we the, the recession officially started, I was in single. Uh, I was in the multifamily underwriting department. We were the busiest ever, Sam. And we were busy not so much uh, processing purchase applications, but refinance applications. If you remember what happened back then, the interest rates dropped by, I think it was 1.5%. Uh, they were in the 5 5.5% five range. They dropped to 3 and a half, three and a half roughly. I'm trying to remember, it's quite a while ago. But uh, And then people who owned apartment buildings, they didn't mind paying the penalty to refinance I mean, people were refinancing and taking millions and millions of dollars. And then I also had some people like Faz that I was underwriting in Alberta, people that I know, including my partner that I had bought that first building as a science investor, and pulling out hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Sam. So I saw the wealth potential yeah. uh, with apartment buildings, which you and I know, and I know that that's uh, more and more increasingly your focus uh, yourself. Yeah, uh, you know, has there's a wealth multiplier, the multiplier effect. So uh, you can make more money. You need more capital up front. So, but I saw that with my own eyes. Despite that, this was the worst recession since the Great Depression, of 1930. People, especially the large landlords, pulling millions and millions and dollars. So I thought, hey, I want to do this when I grow up. You know, yeah. I want to join the parade. Uh, I want freedom. I want all these things. And you know, this is the driver for you. Uh, that freedom that I talk about that I have at a price, let's admit it, but yes, I do live a good life. Yes, once in a while I can have uh, no money, you know, kind of big trips with my three kids in Europe for three weeks, renting a house in the south of France and hiking to Machu Picchu, planning more trips now and stuff. And, you know, I ski, I think, 25 to 30 days this year in the Rockies, right? Nice. Uh, that- that's a lot of skiing, my friend. I tell you, if any skier out there will understand, so proud we have so much snow. That's a lot of freedom. Yeah. And you know, my kid, you know, my 13-year-old, because my older kids are adults, so that I spend a lot of time with them. We, we went hunting. Uh, we, we, we do so much together. I'm with him. I'll spend a lot of time. And with my wife, you know, I cook dinner every night because I'm the guy that works from home. Yeah. So all of that comes at a price. But... I wouldn't trade it for anything else, uh, but uh, that so that was a big revealing moment, and I jumped without a parachute. And I often say, you might have heard say me this in the past, but I've been building wings ever since, and I'm picking up altitude more slowly but steady. 
and uh, wouldn't go back. But that was the defining moment when I saw how much money people were making uh, during the worst recession since the Great Depression with apartment buildings. So that was a defining moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, it's funny that you mentioned you know regret around leaving a government pension. I did the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, after you've been out a few years, you think, oh, if I'd only stayed a few more years, I would have had a you know a bigger a bigger uh, buyout, or I would have invested. In my case, I, w- I, d- I wasn't even invested in my pension. I left <laughs> a year early, which a lot of people would say is foolishness. But I think the way that I overcome that is I, th- I say, well, look how much growth I had in the last you know, year, in the last two years, in the last th- three years, that never would have happened if I had stayed, um, you know, with with those golden handcuffs, right? So, it... Uh, golden handcuffs, all right, that's what they are for sure, golden yeah. handcuffs. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think there's the value in uh, the growth and the learning uh, far outstrips, you know, the monetary value of, uh, of the pension, um, and because, uh, you know, at some point you got to go through the pain of, of learning how to be, mm-hmm. you know, how to be an entrepreneur. So I, I think I'm coming out the back end of that now and just, you know, figuring it out. But, um, you know, the, the benefits of being home and, and uh, being able to tuck your kids in every night and cooking dinner and all these things are, are, yeah. are really, really wonderful. These are the things that attracted me to, you know, this path that, to begin with. That is, you know what, those things, Sam, is what we're going to remember on our deathbeds. Uh, it's oh, yeah. not... What was your experience in a single family home? Because that's where a lot of people start. Um, what was your personal experience investing in, in uh, single family homes? Uh, what, 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 what market were you in? All that kind of stuff. Well, it was the market was in Quebec where we were. Right. Yeah. That's uh, we uh, when I met my wife before we had kids. Uh, we had our two two of our older children were born in Quebec. Uh, then our youngest was born here in Alberta. Uh, the, the experience was very good, although. That's why I don't do it anymore. It's a lot of work. We all know that. Uh, like I said, I, I met my wife. We weren't quite yet married. And even after we were married, I was the guy doing all the maintenance and all of that. So, But we did make some money. It was great because it enabled us to uh, put a good down payment on the house when we moved to Calgary. Uh, so we did make money. But it's a lot of effort. Yeah. Uh, but it was successful. But it's, you know, you've got multiple properties. So you got to move around and do the, the, the maintenance. And, of course, our uh, my wife's home homes that she owned with uh, uh, our brother-in-law were in, in different market areas, smaller towns, and so the markets were kind of, you know, there wasn't a huge appreciation of these properties, and uh, you got to move around, so physically it was more demanding, so I don't like that, so we don't have any small rental properties anymore, it's all multifamily, we have, as I said, 160 doors, seven properties, and um what I like about the large apartment building, Sam, is uh, you, you get better economies of scale. Uh, when you do your run your numbers, you've got to have your, your rental income minus your vacancies, and, uh, and then that gives you your effective gross income minus your operating expenses. As part of the operating expenses, you have two expense items. You have an on-site manager and a property manager. They handle all the hassle. Right, uh, you know, hiring contractors to do the upgrades, uh, evictions, or filling up vacant units, and all of that. And so, if a building doesn't generate enough cash to pay for those two expense items, so again, it's the property manager and the resident manager, then you don't touch it. You know what I'm saying? So that's where the freedom comes from, yeah. because you've got better economies of scale, and all your net units are under one roof. So that's a tremendous advantage that I think guys like you and I like for that very reason. Um, and so gives gives us a better lifestyle, more time to ourselves and pursue our passions yeah. and you know things that we like to do. So that's that's the transition. But 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 like I said, even despite the fact that I was a multi family underwriter, I also had a mental blockage in those those earlier days. Uh, reason being, you know, it's one thing to sit in a cubicle um, and and look at a deal, somebody else's deal and go through the operating statements and you know the utility bills and then say okay the loan amount based on that is going to be x amount it, it was very mechanical emotionally i wasn't involved because it wasn't my money it wasn't me taking the risk it was very i was disconnected with right. the reality of those deals because they weren't my deals yeah. and so that's why when the time came for me to write an offer on a building the buck would stop with me. If this fails, it's my ass on the line. It's it's my credibility on the line. So it, it and so it took me a while after I left CMHC to 
whoa, okay, to, to, to connect the dots and really reality, that's the reality, right? CMEC was not, it's not a real world, right? People, they're, they're not entrepreneurs. They don't take risks. They don't know anything about risk. I think that includes our prime minister, by the way, doesn't, doesn't get it. Uh, yeah. uh, never, never taken a risk in his life because, uh, boy, he'd be behaving differently, that's for sure. Sorry about that. You know uh, what? You're not alone. Back. You're not alone in your thinking. Oh, there. my <laughs> gosh. I mean, he should, he should go out in the real world, but he just doesn't know it. But to me, that was my reality check. And, uh, but I was nervous writing that first offer, I remember vividly. So I do understand how people, considering to invest in large multi-million dollar properties such as apartment buildings, do feel. I, I do remember that feeling, but get over it. <laughs> you know, if, if you want to achieve the lifestyle that we dream of, that we are slowly building, you and I, get over it. Get over yourself. Get out of yourself. You're the obstacle. You know, the, you're yeah. the obstacle. Book. Great book. The Obstacle is the Way, Ryan Holiday. You got to read that. Yeah, Very yeah. Cool book. You, you know what? I, I'm going a game changer. To, I'm probably going to listen to it since that's how I consume most of my books. So Me too. That's <laughs> how I listened. And that's what I did, Sam. That's what I did. I, I'm the same as you. Audible. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I love Audible. You're gonna love it, Sam. You're gonna love it. It's a book you want to listen over and over, and it introduces you to the Stoics. You know, really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I've been listening to a podcast called um, uh, "The History of Rome." So yeah. I, so I've I got. Have... Yeah, yeah, Mike Duncan, right? He he did yeah, that. So. Man, does he ever have a huge body of work? I mean, that was years and years. He's got hundreds and hundreds of, of episodes. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, and it's really neat to see his evolution because he started podcasting right when it first began, and now now he's got one called uh, Revolutions as well. And I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I enjoy uh, I enjoy the history uh, part of it too, but it's also yeah. interesting to listen to the history of uh, of finance because what we're doing now is no different than than what uh, uh, the Romans did thousands of years ago, devaluating uh, your currency, printing money, and uh, the oh, yeah. a lot of times the results of things that happen uh, when uh, when that happens, the economy goes bad. Um, sometimes it is revolution. So. Uh, yeah. How can we prepare ourselves for, you know, the coming the coming revolution, which uh, uh, which could you know could be f financial, could be uh, you know, imagine a change in um, in the uh, in the in the world um, uh, currency if it was no longer the, the U.S. dollar, if it was changed to something else, what would that do? Uh, you know, instead of a petrodollar across the world, we, you know, who who, who knows yeah. uh, what it would be? It might be the Chinese the Chinese money, or it might be. But yeah. uh, this is something that most people don't pay attention to. I spent a lot of time thinking about it and, and looking at it, and uh, that is one of the primary reasons that I, I like, you know, income-producing assets. Because no, no matter what the uh, prevailing uh, the money turns into, whether whether we're, we're paying in Canadian dollars or, or all of a sudden we're paying in, uh, um, you know, a barter system, or there's there's a new uh, currency that gets used across the world. People are, need a place to live, and they're going to pay for yeah. it. They're going to pay for it in whatever currency that exists, and yeah. uh, you know I, I, you, we can be fairly certain that our property rights are going to uh, stay the same unless you know something uh, terrible happens, like the French Revolution, and the guillotine comes yeah. out, and all of <laughs> all of us, yeah. uh, you know, the new the new royalty. I guess that's what yeah. you call people like us. You know, we start <laughs> losing our heads, but. Uh, you know, I, I think that that likelihood is probably you know that that level of violence is probably fairly low, but uh, yeah, no, it's a good place to invest. There's no doubt, Canada is a more stable country. I just wish, I just wish that we'd sometimes be less Canadian. Can I say that as much as I love this country? Yeah. You know, always uh, we're so uh, apologetic, you know, and uh, just right now in this debate about this pipeline, and uh, my yeah. goodness gracious, we well, yeah. are being we're being hijacked by environmentalists. Did you see the study this week that came out with a professor from Edmonton that a lot of the uh, people, I, I hope you don't mind us getting political a little bit. I mean, you're in Kamloops. It's going to go through your town, buddy, right? I mean, but no, I, you know what? I was. This is the second podcast I'm doing in the, in the last 24 hours. And there was a podcast with, I don't know if you know, Erwin Soweto. Oh, yeah. Zito. He's uh, Mr. Hamilton, good friend of mine, a Great. fantastic man like you. Great podcast, um, yeah. You, 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 you know, I was in, uh, I, I come from Eastern Canada, uh, so, born and raised in Quebec, spent a lot of time in Ontario, where, where I studied, went to university and all of that. And so, I have to admit, mea culpa, until I moved to Alberta, uh, west, I, I did not know this reality about oil and gas. I admit to it. But now that I do know, and I follow it daily, and I hang out with 
people involved in the oil and gas industry at a high level too with very successful companies. People don't realize that it, it, it represents 30% of Canada's wealth. 30% of our country's wealth comes from Western Canada, Saskatchewan and Alberta with the oil and gas and now of course a lot in northern BC. Uh, this is significant. These are schools, these are hospitals, these are social services to the homeless that are being provided. And we are so apologetic. I mean, the, 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 the pipeline already exists, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, we're talking about twinning it. And it's been in place the existing one for like decades, there's not a lot of accidents. I mean, stuff will happen once in a while. Like you can't, there's no such a thing as a 100% risk-free endeavor in life, right? Yeah. But overall, the risk is pretty minimal. We have some of the most stringent environmental uh, you know, policies and procedures in place around the world, for crying out loud. And yet, you know, little Canadian, oh, no, no, we're going to destroy the environment. Exactly. Well, you know that those uh, demonstrators are being financed by a lot of charities in the U.S., which are pro U.S. oil and gas? Well, they, yeah, they, that's the tide, the, you know, the Tides Foundation, and uh, there you go. What's, what's the other company? And yeah, a lot of their donors are, are our competitors. So our so our competitors are under, are completely undermining our national interests, and we're sitting here, you know, letting it happen. Right? Losing market share. Yeah. We are losing market share. Our our oil is landlocked. Anyways. I don't know. I mean, this is where you become an entrepreneur, and you 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 know you don't have a an employer that owns you, like you, the RCMP, me, CMHC, and you can think wider. You have a macro perspective. You know, you need to know about history, right? Because if you're if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. Remember the saying, and the, yeah. I like you love this kind of stuff going back thousands of years. The the philosophers, the Greeks, and all that. Because you're right that that uh, at the end of the day, I don't know how much humans don't change that much, don't you think? No, you know what we uh, you know and uh, and our behavior, you know, the behavior of a, you know a large group of people, behavior of society, it, you know, it, it doesn't. Change change much you know i think we're we're very blessed to live in this era the last 20 years there's been there's been uh, you know because of the, the technology and how interconnected we can all be now um yeah. you know we uh we live in a time that um that is probably going to go down in history as the biggest change and turning point um uh, you know, of all time, as far as information goes, oh, yeah. you know, we, had, we the industrial revolution was was one thing, yeah. and uh, but the fact now that everybody has the full knowledge of humanity ac accessible to them twenty four seven in the palm of your hand uh, is yeah. abs is absolutely uh, amazing, and we we live we're very privileged, you know, and blessed to live in this time, and that that might save us from you know the war and the strife that's happened in the past when these same types of things have happened, so. Uh, I, I want to say, so for me, we can relate that to real estate. Uh, great, great presentation. I think he's an MIT uh, professor. You know, people are talking about electrical cars and all of that. Presentation. His name uh, is Tony Siba. Tony, T-O-N-Y, Siba, S-E-B-A. Um, and the reason I want to raise that is it's going to have an impact on our rental business eventually. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's tomorrow, though. Some people seem to predict it's going to happen tomorrow. No. But I do, as a real estate investor, want to think ahead how is that going to impact my business, my, my, my rental properties, and how do I adjust to that? And you talked about technology. Yeah, I have technology can help us too as entrepreneurs, and uh, we're taking, taking that turn to incorporate that into our business. It is pretty cool, although sometimes it's also alienating. You would agree with me. You need to turn off the stuff. Right, and that's why I'm an outdoors guy, uh, you know, yeah. backcountry hiker and stuff. Um, it, but it's got mostly advantages, I believe. But I, I stopped. I'm not getting notifications, you know, anymore. I, I go in when I want to go in uh, to check my emails and stuff like that because you become like a monkey mind, right? Uh -huh. You know, always looking for a stimulus. And uh, so, uh, uh, but it does have advantages. And as business owners, we need to be aware of that, and it has impact on our business. So for me, I'm taking that seriously. Despite the fact that I don't think it's going to take over uh, yet, uh, I don't think any any of us are going to drive electrical cars for a while yet. <laughs> it will come though. Self driving car, self driving cars are coming. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean they're they're here, but they're they're not legal in Canada yet, unfortunately. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's. Uh, um, yeah, while it's, we're talking, I'm just looking for this uh, Tony Siva, but you want to? It's very cool. Uh, presentation yeah well yeah. there's another presentation I'll link to as well uh, you know everybody Bitcoin's been in the news quite a bit but uh, somebody that's been talking about cryptocurrency for a long time oh, uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember the guy's guy's name but uh, you know he listed all the benefits of this type of technology mm -hmm. the, the security you can have um, mm -hmm. 
he, he was even talking about uh, in a, he did a TED talk and I'll link to it in, the, in our show notes here but he was talking about uh, the security that uh, people can have uh, um, when taking title to a property now in uh, you know, I think it's Brazil or another South American country where people would buy land you know farmland or whatever the case may be and then uh, you know the the the, the uh, the government would change or a new dictator would come along and he'd say, okay, well, this now belongs to my, you know, there's a lot of cronyism, right? And now I'm in power, so now, oh, yeah. my, now all my friends are going to get stuff. But now with cryptocurrency, you can't go in and doctor <laughs> records. Um, there, There's a permanent record and it's going to, it's you know, so the technology, the uh, the blockchain uh, is going to, uh, is already helping, I guess, with, uh, um, yeah. with, uh, with a lot of the... Um, things that are so important to us as a society um, as far as, you know, property rights go because, you know, that's really the bedrock of our of our oh, society yeah. is, is property rights. There's, you know, what do they say that uh, uh, property is nine-tenths of the law and, uh, you know, I, I used to enforce the criminal code and it's true, the property section, you know, is like yeah. this and, and the, you know, the, yeah. the don't kill or murder or anything is, is like this, right? So... Uh, it's a man's castle, right? It's a, it's a sac- sacrosanct is the word I think we use. Yeah. Right? A man's property sac- sacrosanct, I think is the terminology. Yeah. It's, it's precious. It's a man's environment. Yeah. Well, for sure. It's at the base of our society and ownership uh, structure for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's and I that's why it's so important to own to own assets, you know, most people just own their product their product, productivity, they just own their own time and they trade that for for uh for, you know, really small for their life. They, for they their life. Yeah, and they're trading it for, you know, 10 bucks, well, 20 bucks an hour, $30, $40, $50 yeah. an hour, whatever, whatever the case may be, right? So mm-hmm. and I think uh the real the real blessing we have in this day and age is is anybody who wants to be can become the king. It used to be you had to be born you know, it was a uh, it was a g- genetic lottery, but nowadays, anybody that wants to can take a course from you and learn how to do it, yeah. and they can uh, choose and, and say, you know what, I'm going to be one of the wealth holders in our society. I'm going to be one of the ten percent. Um, whereas it used to be that it was the king and the nobles. It was all uh, passed through birth, and uh, but now it can be it can be anybody with the drive and, and the work ethic to get there. So yeah, and a couple of things. So, but it's not easy, right? I think you and I don't. It's sell, it's uh, not easy. No. It's not easy. But it's possible. Biggest, it's absolutely more than possible. It's feasible. and But again, the biggest obstacle we all face is our mindset. That presentation is called, by the way, I really highly recommend it. It's called, uh, so Tony Siva, Clean Disruption, Energy, and Transportation. It's an hour long, but uh, yeah. Um, it's a pretty powerful argument. Uh, like I said, I am taking, I'm not freaking out over it, but I am mindful of it as I conduct my business and as I look at uh, my long-term uh, investment horizon, you know, what, how to adapt to that over time. So it's something I'll be monitoring how fast these changes occur with electrical vehicles and all of that. But uh, yeah. a lot of these problems, but very cool. Uh, very cool. Well, I'll certainly, for sure. certainly look it up and uh, t- maybe text me the link. I'll include it in the show notes. I'll do that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll do that. So, uh, you know, we're, unfortunately, we're quickly running out of time here. But um, maybe just uh, you got, can I uh, ask some rapid-fire questions here? Sure. Okay, uh, what are you afraid of, Pierre Paul, and how do you overcome your fear? Actually, I'm not afraid of anything, and uh, I work on it every day. When you have fear, it's your reptilian brain, the original brain that we developed over thousands of years. It's just a matter of changing your thought. We have a choice of our thoughts. Uh, We realize that they're not imposed upon us. You don't like that thought of fear? Think of something else. Uh, actually, the gratitude rock, you know, is there as you go. If you have fear, look at what you got. That's right. I mean, fear, most of our fears don't materialize. Yeah. You know, most of our fears don't materialize. So I'm not afraid of anything. Sometimes I get tired of fighting back fears because they, they show up. Uh, but then I look at my results and I bust that fear all the time. But it's a, it's a mental exercise. It's a daily one because yeah. we're just wired that way, right? Fight or flight, uh, you know. So, But no, I don't fear anything. Yeah. Uh, no. I don't. Well, you know what? You've done a lot of uh, work in the self-development world, and the yeah. fact that you carry around, um, you know, a, a, an inspiration with you in, in your pocket, you, you know, you, you've you've learned how to wrestle, uh, um, you know, with the self-talk and the and the doubts and and the fears, and and so you know, you're 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 <laughs> you're seasoned there. So that's yeah, that's great. So, uh, Pierre Paul, what would you tell your younger self? Just. You know, it's funny you ask me because my kids are older than yours. So I do. What do you tell your kids? Uh, 
Was that? What do you tell your kids? <laughs> well, that's it. That's it. I mean, in a way, I'm telling my kids what I wish somebody had told me. Be yourself. Listen to that inner voice. That's who we are, right? Listen to your soul. Intuition. You can call it intuition. Some people call it God. I don't know. I don't care what you call it. But that that little voice. L learn to listen to it. That that is who you are, really. Uh, because again, that fear gets in the way. So this is a, an ongoing conversation. Like you know, my kids is a TRU in science. It's not easy. You know, he has his struggles. But we are a close knit family. We get on Skype every every week. Oh, you got an exam today? I'm going to text you. You know, and uh, you know, little emoji, love you, buddy. And you know, you're going to do well. And uh, those are the kind of things. You're right. You're worth it, Pierre Paul. Sam, you're worth it. Uh, you know, we, we keep putting limiting beliefs on ourselves so that we are not deserving and also things like that. Oh, man, just be yourself. You're okay the way you are. You are okay. Uh, yeah. Listen, personal development is, is a da daily thing for me. Like you see this morning, I told you I was listening to 10X, a uh, short podcast on Tim Ferriss, uh, you know, thinking bigger. And like obstacle, the obstacle is the way. This is a daily thing. This is no bullshit. And that's how people who succeed at anything do. Yeah. But it's a choice. I choose these thoughts that serve my purpose and my goals and my life philosophy. Yeah. Right. So I hear that's what I would tell myself. So it's a long answer, but no, I think it's supposed funny. to be rapid fire. Well, I, sh I shared with you, uh, you know, the full focus planner that I'm using, uh, that I started using, you know, Michael Michael Hyatt's program. And, and what I love about it is, you know, every day there's uh, there's a quote, right? And uh, you know, you go through your daily routine, you know, your your gratitude, and that that really is the key, right? And and uh, it's. It's really nice to see uh, a different quote, an inspirational quote, every single day because it, it does. It sits. It sits yeah, with you. You know. I have those plastered all over. I print them for my kids to see in the kitchen, on the fridge, I, yeah, everywhere. But again, right, Sam? It's all about choosing your thought process. Yeah. And this is the beauty. I'm going. I'm making a link to being an entrepreneur. You have the freedom of stepping back and taking a little bit of time and say, okay, I, I think for myself, it's not imposed by. You know, an employer or anybody else like that, but we all have that choice. Every every one of us. Yeah. Every one of us. Yeah. Well, Pierre Paul, I've I've really enjoyed our conversation. I'm so looking forward to spending a few hours with you uh, uh, next week, and uh, you, you know, have a few beers too, hopefully. So. <laughs> for sure, we'll do that. For sure, we'll do that. And please, Sam, tell your folks they can go and check out my stuff at uh, multifamilyinvestingcanada.com. We've got an online course that's taken me years with the assistance of a professional uh, consultant to develop and a live event in Hamilton. We'll have one in Edmonton in the fall. But if you sign up to get my ebook, you know, I'll keep you posted. I don't send a lot of stuff uh, like emails. You know, some people send you emails after email. Not like that. I only send stuff that has content and something valuable to offer. And I uh, absolutely look forward to seeing you uh, next week for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, be, I'll post a link. Uh, um, Multifamilyinvestingcanada.com. Multifamilyinvestingcanada.com. Yeah, and send, send, me, uh, send me a link to your, uh, your, new, your new video series too uh, when, you, yeah. when you have that yeah. wrapped up. We'll do that. Yeah, for sure. Looking for forward sure. to seeing that. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thanks, Sam. Um, Thank you. Have a great day, buddy. Thanks, Pierre Paul. You too. Cheers. Cheers. Before we close the show, I just want to say that all the activities Rents undertakes, including this podcast, benefits our bursary program. We've given thousands of bursaries to post-secondary students in real estate-related fields of study. And in that light, I'm asking that wherever you're listening to this, please comment and let us know what you think, good or bad. You're also invited to our next meeting for free. You'll learn something new from one of our speakers and even have a chance to pitch your deal. Do you need cash? Are you looking for property to buy? Share what you're missing with the group and watch your business grow. At recent meetings, there was over $1,500 in finder's fees handed out just for providing a name and a number to someone who was selling a property. There's always at least a million dollars in the room looking for the right opportunity. So this is your chance to pitch your deal. You never know where you're going to meet your next joint venture partner. If you're new to real estate investment, we want to hear from you too. You have unique talents and experiences that we can all benefit from. So please come share. You'll have the opportunity to learn the business and meet other like-minded people looking to make the world a better place. Remember that everything you want is in the hands of others. So come learn how to serve them. Lastly, we ask that you leave us a five-star review. This will help others who need unbiased real estate education find us. To join us in person or online, please email info at rents.website. 
That's info at rents.website. See you next time.